<clears throat> Unmuting. <laughs> yeah, I think I uh, muted everyone's uh, mics right off the bat, just so we don't have feedback. So if you want to. I'll mute too. Okay. Uh, welcome. Just I accidentally hit a setting, so I have to admit everybody one by one. That's a little cumbersome. We'll have to fix that for next time. Hello, Andreas. I muted everyone's microphones right off the bat, so if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, that'd be great. And if there's feedback, I'll mute it if it if need be. So. All right. Well, I think we're going to try the 40 minute free version here. So we'll see if we can hopefully stick to that 40 minute timeline. And we'll go from there. Uh, I think what we'll do also this time around, maybe we'll wait until the end of the meeting to kind of do some introductions so that way everybody's here and then um, everybody knows everybody then. All right, um, let's maybe get started on that, that first topic I put up there. Do we wanna talk a little bit about the ECB development and, and how that's going? Is there a way, I, I have the PCV on my, my screen. Is there a way I can share my screen? Yeah, you should be able to, um, if you go to the bottom of your here. middle of your screen and hit share, there should be a box that comes up so you can share your screen. Can everyone see that? Yep. You see a PC board on your screen? I guess everybody's muted, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll unmute everybody if I can. I don't I see you. Okay, does everyone see a PC, uh, PC board on their screen? Yes. 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 Did you guys ever think it was this hard to design a PC board? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the more experienced ones out there know exactly how much of a pain in the neck this is. But uh, yeah, it's not easy. But I think we've uh, distilled it down to <clears throat> one basic board, a rope cope stun. <clears throat> and it, it probably looks like we're, we're arguing back and forth, but really, Development is just that. It's coming up with putting all the, excuse me. <clears throat> I had a Fig Newton for breakfast. <laughs> putting all the ideas together and just taking the good ones and then getting the parts and going, oh shoot, the relay smashes up against the, uh, the, the nano or this doesn't fit or like the uh, build the whole board and then there was a capacitor in the way of the ethernet module. And it's just those little things. And this is, this is just a prototype. I mean, there's, there's probably still 10 mistakes in that board. And um, it hasn't been done yet. It hasn't been put together. So um, it's, it's certainly a, a process to make a board, that's for sure. But is uh, just getting the feeling, is this, is it, will this board work? Like, does it meet the needs of certainly most of the people and the, the basic idea of building a board. So that's the question. So far I followed the discussion um, of this board. I would say it's a good basic board. Um, so I would say, yes, it would fit the basic needs. And the, the thing with, let's um, you see it when it's put together, um, 
Well, I had um, maybe I can show it my board later. Um, I had started um, to develop um, a small PCB for myself, as I showed the last time. And now I have my first prototype um, sitting on the, my desk. And um, well, for example, my worst mistake was um, for the I um, to see um, bus. Um, I have the wrong footprint for the level conver converter, um, mm. and the LDOs um, getting warmer than I would like. So um, I need to redesign the board a bit. Um, my goal currently is um, to make these, um, well, the, the main mistake, um, the level converter and um, put it, this board then as version one um, online. So if someone wants to take a look on, on that, but I think um, during the, the development, I've, I've seen now some things, um, so I want to totally redesign the board. Now I've, well, put my fingers on it. And so I will think to do a complete redesign. So I think, yes, putting it together is, is a different story than um, designing it on, on the PC. Um, I, I, I wish you good luck, but in my experience, it could, um, yeah, you, you could, find some things you, you didn't um, think about um, during the computer design phase. I have I did order a, a week ago, most of the components from DigiKey. And I printed it out on paper, basically what you're seeing in real size. And I pushed all the components through the paper. In terms of physical alignment, it does seem to work. And notice the first version I had, the capacitors were too big, but too big is better than too small. <laughs> Apparently they can make a uh, thousand microfarad capacitors, like one centimeter diameter, which today is kind of amazing. But uh, yeah, the, like the proximity switches, I did a little video, YouTube video on that yesterday. And to be able to, uh, to be able to use a proximity switch and a micro switch, using the same three pads, I think that, that's a bit of an accomplishment. I, I made the, uh, the circuit yesterday on a prototype board and the circuit itself does work. It switches just fine and then you can use the micro switch. So any thoughts on that, on the switch isolation circuit? Any thoughts, any improvements, any, I guess if it works, it works. And it, it's got EMI and ESD protection. And you can short it, you can tie it to high. You can, it's should be almost indestructible, but uh, anyway, any, any thoughts on the isolation circuits? Um, the only thing I was thinking about was a potential uh, LED or something that would show that it's reverse connected. If you ha happen to be a dummy and you swapped it around, you accidentally put uh, positive to negative, that kind of thing. That was the only thing I could think of. Well, really with a switch, there is no positive or negative. You're just, right. you're just hook, you're just grounding the thing out. So like there is no like plugging in a two prong plug in into the wall incorrectly. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's pretty, uh, don't want to use foolproof or idiot proof, but it, it kind of is. <laughs> I did bring like A1 and A2 out at the bottom where it's like the USB port of the Nano. And then I moved that, uh, what was it? Calpo. And it makes good sense. To be able to use a right angle plug, uh, move the Nano up farther and the, the uh, Ethernet module still fit. But now you can use a right angle plug inside the case. Probably still the best thing to do is just to drill a hole in the side of the case where the USB is. And then just put the thing in and then just silicone the, the cable in. The frustrating part with a USB cable is in order to get the plug in the box, you still have to drill that size of hole anyway to get the cable inside the box. So that's going to be kind of a problem. It's not like you can take the cable apart and then rebuild the USB plug either. So 
And in terms of uh, the relay, 40 amp, I wouldn't go any less than a 40 amp relay. I, uh, I use a 40 amp relay in, my, in the John Deere, in the autonomous tractor. And I'm gonna have to put two in because it runs so hot you can barely touch it. Even at, uh, it does use a lot of power, especially use the 24 volt converter. The whole system uses a lot of power. And that turning a motor off and on and having it kicking back and stuff, the spikes go really high and it'll just burn the contacts of anything probably less than 40 amps. So I, I sure don't want to make a smaller relay just, just to save some board space. I think there's, this is only a four inch by five inch board. And when you, when you print it out, I mean, it, it just fits in your hand. Like it's, it's not big. It's a, it's small board to begin with. So anyway, I'm doing all the talking. I should uh, be listening. <laughs> Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm only listening, but this is not my thing. <laughs> I have no ideas about all these PCB layouts. Yeah. For me too. I think this this stuff is kind of a little bit over my head. I like I understand what it is. Um, I. I'm very excited about it, and I think it'll be neat to see how that's going to improve people getting into it from kind of the ground level. Uh, I think it's going to make it a lot easier. Um, I, I guess the question would be like from here out, would it go to a third party manufacturer that would put it together, or would it be more to the end of you just print off your own board and solder in all the components? Well, you can when get I, it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I would say it would be nice if you have some sort of a vendor um, where you can get it, especially for the people um, yeah, getting into it, because it's quite simple to screw on a few cables. And, um, and soldering, I think, scares some people. Um, but on the other hand, um, I don't know how easy it is to find a, a good or a trustworthy vendor. At least in, in the EU, we have, um, as I said the last time, you have a lot of fun um, if you want to, to sell um, a PCB because you have for each country um, make sure that if it's thrown away, um, it can be recycled and you have for each country i think it's about 1000 euros once and a few hundred euros per year without selling a single board so, uh, just upfront cost uh, so um yeah i um i'm designing the board um just well mostly for fun learning and as i said um Maybe for my brother in, in law, and I think in, in this dimension it's cool. But even if I would like to sell it, um, I could only sell it outside the EU, uh, mm -hmm. even if I'm living inside the EU, um, without um, investing way, way, way too much money um, to be happy with it. Um, so I would say a good vendor is really a nice solution, but I don't know if it's so easy to find a vendor where you can get, um, order it nearly all around the world. Well, I, I don't know if some laws like this is in other countries too, um, and how it's, depending if you import it. Um, the fun thing is I've learned is if you import it, you as a, you as the person importing is, I legally, um, yeah, you have to, um, make sure you comply to law. If you buy it for your personal use, it's okay. So if I sell it to someone in America or Canada or, or China and he sells it back, it, it, it's okay. But if I sell it to my neighbor, it's a nightmare. Hmm. <laughs> so I, yeah, um, I don't want really to understand it. I have given up. Um, so I think the main problem is 
to find a good vendor um, th that is isn't too putting too much um, yeah for putting his or her brand on on it um, because if the PCB in the end cost uh, well 300 um, US dollar or euros well it's the well, someone might buy it, but I think it's not really the, the point for, for selling it for such a steep price. I didn't realize that was the case. That uh, <laughs> throws a loop in things. <laughs> well, maybe it's uh, not on, on the other side of the, of the large pond. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, watching how Brexit is working, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> there's issues. <laughs> well, again, I, you know, I don't think that this is, it should be really considered as a product that, you know, we want to promote as a solution to everybody's auto steer problems. I think that, it's pretty easy to lose focus on on what this actually is, and that it's a it's a learning tool. And if you have the skills to put together a board, and and learn about, you know, like like you said, Andreas, I mean, or even Wilbert, like this isn't your wheelhouse to making a PC board. But as you can see, you can download the software for free, and you can make your make your board and do some electronics, and send it off to China, and for two dollars they'll make you a board and. For 30, they'll, they'll send it back to you in, in five days and holy cow, I have a PC board in my hand, you know, just like that. If you come up with a, with a simpler idea, you know, like, a, like a tailgate opener, and you just want to put all the components on one PC board, well, now you know how to do that. Mm -hmm. So, I, I like I say, I think it's sometimes easy to lose perspective of what this project is, and that's to help people like, and even if there's just six of us that build it worldwide, six people that have learned a lot. I mean, I've learned a lot about it and I, I'm sure a lot of you, I mean, everyone has learned a lot. So to, to try to put Outback or Trimble out of business with this <laughs> is, uh, is maybe heading the wrong way too. So we really need to balance those things. And, and that's why I modified the circuit to uh, like the pads for the resistors and the pads for the diodes and stuff. Just make them bigger so that they're easier to solder. And in some ways, let's make the board an inch bigger so that it's easy to put together. So it's not so crammed in. You know, it, a board an inch longer would, uh, it'll still fit in your tractor cab, I'm pretty sure. And just, if we really wanted to make a small board, then you eliminate all the little boards and just make the whole thing surface mount. And then it would be, you know, Five, five centimeters by five centimeters, you can make the whole board really, really small. But again, that's not the point. The point is for us to build stuff and have it work and to learn. Okay. Uh, uh, I will do some examination about the building this board. Um, my cousin is working at the company who builds uh, such hardware. And um, I will ask him uh, about things about to build such a thing and uh, to sell it also in Europe. Because um, there are small companies in the Panemir in Slovenia and um, if they do some um, basic boards for development, um, they produce it in Slovenia and get it here. Mm. So there's a company, uh, they work together with BlackRock and the company is called Beeps, who are making uh, things for seeking people under the snow. And if you, if you want to see the, uh, a board with some circuit SMD parts, I've just put um, my board on the camera. Cool. So Could you bring it on the top? Yeah, uh, see, maybe oh, Brian. Okay, I'll unshare. I'll stop sharing. 
There we go. And so, uh, let's see how we can make yours bigger. Maybe I just talking. I see. I think you might have to go to the bottom and hit share. Uh, it's that's just screen though. Uh, I'm not sure how to do that. Pretty good. See, I like those screw connectors on the edge of the board rather than pins. What do you guys think? Yes, I, connectors is always better than pins. Especially for a DIY board that you're probably going to take out and put back in 10 times. Yeah. And I think it's easier, less vibrating problems. You don't have to crimp some parts on, on the other ends of the um, cables. Yeah. And I just put on the other parts, the ESP board and the F9P. And then the board looks well, like this. So that's the, the whole board with um, motor driver included. These are these two little parts. This board is 15 times eight centimeters, but I think when redesigning it, I might use the ESP VROM module directly, then it fits under the F9P, then it might go to eight uh, times 10 centimeters from the size. So it might, might shrink it even a bit more. That's really cool. Super cool. But um, I think it's uh, not a good idea to uh, sort uh, the ESP on the board, or is, is uh, it better to have plugs? Well, it's, it has advantages and disadvantages. Um, the, the main advantage I see is um, putting the ESP on board is um, you reduce the problem um, that it might get some contact issues, vibrate loose, whatever. And the other problem you um, solve is the question, which ESP board do you want to use? Because I, um, for my feeling, there are nowadays nearly a hundred different boards with different, slightly different pin outs. So um, if you tell someone he should get an ESP board and he just buys the wrong version, it, it won't work. And um, the, the ESP putting directly on board, um, it, it's the part, um, the, the antenna is included on the part you would solder on the board. Um, so, um, yeah. And from the price, it's, it won't make much difference. Um, you can get a cheap ESP board for about, I think it's seven or eight euros. Um, the parts, including micro USB um, plug and the uh, um, USB converter, so you can download the code and the ESP module itself, is, it's about the same price. So you get a bit more flexibility from replacing the parts, um, less problems with vibrating and you save some space. So I would say Go, go for it because you you get away with the problem which which um, board you should use. That was a long problem for me. I have um, th this version with 30 pins I have. So I, I started designing the board with this version. Then started looking around and then, well, it seems like versions with, I think is. 36 or 38 pins become more common. Um, other people say the feather form factor is better. Other people again um, tell again different sizes. Um, so for me, I think it's the easiest thing to say, just put it directly on the board. And since this board has so many SMD parts already, soldering another SMD part, um, won't make it more difficult or um... okay. Yeah. 
Um, I'm just looking at the time here. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're already at what, 20, 24 minutes in or so. Um, do we want to talk a little bit more about PCB or would we like to get into a couple of the other things as far as uh, making documentation and that kind of thing? There's uh, well, well, just, just a quick sum on, uh, summary on the board then. Should I quote unquote simplify it, make it a little bit bigger and then allow to be able to have the screw terminals? You can still use the pins because the screw terminals are 0 0.2 inch spacing, whereas the pins are 0 0.1 inch spacing. And you can tie the two pins together. And then so you can still use, like if there was a three pin connector, now you would just use a six pin connector. It takes up uh, more space. You can even get 0 0.1 inch um, connectors that are for um, thin wires, but the, um, on the left part of my board, the, the one with eight connectors is for 0 0.1 spacing. Okay. Can you post the part number on the PCB yeah. form? Perfect. Then maybe even you can put it in the chat here too if you, if you come across it. Cool. I, I like the screw terminal idea. I, over pins, but like you said, if it works either way, that's awesome. And then connectors to the outside world, um, every farm uses them, like the weather pack connectors, just wires out to weather pack connectors. You can buy 500 on, on eBay for 20 bucks and they come sealed connectors. They're not as pretty as a surface mount attached to the board type of connector but they are really easy to do and anyone can crimp the pins. You can get the crimper for 20 bucks along with uh, If people want to spend 40, $50 on professional edge connect or, or panel mount connectors, but uh, certainly an easy option is to just clip the thing together, especially since you want to probably change it again. <laughs> along, And then now you have to desolder all your wonderful little connectors and so that's something else we've been thinking about is how do you connect this PC board now to the rest of the world, to the motor, to the wheel angle sensor and that sort of thing. And those weather pack connectors are, are pretty, pretty simple. So those weather pack connectors, are they similar to the ones we plug in, say, to the dog two? Yes. Like that would be what yeah. was made by its, uh, who makes those for death? Hundreds of companies. Yeah, okay. They're available all over the world. It's the same as like the uh, like the Princess Auto headlight yes. plug-in. Yeah, yeah. You get male and female, so you can make extension cords out of it. Um, Farmtronics here in, in Canada has them. Yeah. Every so many companies have them. It's Every like a uh, gel color Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They just clip together. I think that's the route to go. It, me too. Um, okay, seeing as it's, we got, looks like a little more than 10 minutes left. Uh, should we talk just a little bit about documentation and kind of, we talked a bit last time about a stable system, which we kind of have that set up now. Now we should talk about a little bit about documentation and how we want to package that and who's gonna do it. That's the, the bigger part, so. Uh, I, how, how should we roll it out? Should we just have uh, work a little bit more on the wiki side of things? What are your What are your thoughts there? I'll just throw it out and we'll talk about it for a little bit. Nobody wants to do it. <laughs> yes, uh, a notary is from our group. Um, we have a Telegram group in Austria and in Germany with 250 members for RG Open GPS. And nobody is writing <laughs> documentation on the wiki or asking <laughs> here. And yeah, it's, it's very hard to bring people to write down some. Um, I have done some, some documentation on my homepage for German speaking. Um, for for the people who was, was coming to my lectures, and yeah, but 
it's a very hard tool and it needs many, many, many time to do this. Yeah, and I think it's not easy. But um, I think the, the wiki I've done, um, it's very, very easy to handle and, and very easy to upgrade or to write text. But yeah, it's not easy. I think uh, to have a stable version, who is online for, I think, for three months and uh, have some translations to some um, other languages would be good. And maybe we can have a little team who can do this. I think that that's probably a good way to think of it. Um, like, I like that just kind of a, a trial, right? You had said a trial for three months. Is that right, Andreas? Like, yeah. Yes, I think um, now we have a stable version and um, it, sh it should stay uh, and, and the master repository and, and or, or, or big changes are only going to the development repository. So um, we can do some documentation or uh, uh, do the um, uh, languages. Uh, as Brian told, uh, every time you change a lot of the software, the, the translations go away or? Yeah, it's, it's a terrible problem. Uh, the other thing about documentation I find too is I'm just kind of learning as I go what, what everything actually does on the screen and so forth. So I, I know if I were to write documentation, I would only be able to write what I know and that might be in error. So I, I'm scared to post it knowing that I might be totally wrong or off base. So I, I don't think we should have that fear. We should perhaps just put everything out there and then people who know more about it can kind of correct as we go along where if there was a way to comment maybe and say, you know, this is wrong, maybe, Check it around like a kind of like you would do on a Wikipedia page, right? No thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Yes. basically, laughs> like well, basically, the, the idea of a, of a wiki, everyone puts what they can and they think they know in there and if someone um, knows it better he writes down what's yeah what's the correct version but yeah um, and coming from the quiet guy that's been listening along here i would agree that getting something out there it's probably more likely to get it fixed than trying to get it perfect before it's ever published oh absolutely yes yeah yes and um, I also think we don't need only one language, so only English for the start, because if someone writes some wrong in German or in France, it's it's somewhere no? and so it's I think it's for the start it's better to have only English with it. Mm -hmm. So maybe I I would deactivate it on my page. Or I'll write down my comment, so please write down in English. Ooh. Yeah, that's it's, it's tricky, right? No, it's tricky, but I think there's I, no there's no automatic translation into other languages. Maybe we find another way to do that with automatic translations, but uh, to, do, to do this in, in one language is hard and to do this in seven languages is impossible. <laughs> it's not impossible, Andreas. It's improbable. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my English is not so... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
It's a language thing. <laughs> it's a language thing, yes. Maybe next time I will uh, use Google Translate in real time. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh. Or I, I am Topper Girl speaking German and <laughs> you can listen yeah, to us. Next meeting is in German. Ich kann verstehen ein bisschen Deutsch, aber nicht sehr gut. Hey. <laughs> okay, this is the thing I want <laughs> to ask you next time. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's a... I keep thinking I'm going to have more time to make videos and shoot the days go by and the time goes by and it's a big project. It, it's mind boggling how something so simple as turning a steering wheel can be so complicated <laughs> and have so many layers and uh, uh, it's a big project. It's, it's fun though. It's a good thing that the software is so good that it, it's so intuitive. <laughs> <laughs> but. I, I will give you kudos though I think uh, having talked to some other people and showed them the program they say oh man this makes so much more sense than a Trimble or whatever else just in the way some of the things are laid out so I think you got to give yourself a little bit more credit Brian <laughs> so you guys like the uh, the snap distance yes yeah. I yes, like yes. Um, there was uh, at my lectures, there was many people ask, asking for this, but uh, I had no time to write it to you. But I think this is a very good uh, thing for many people. Yeah. And the next big wishes from our European is uh, field management. <laughs> <laughs> But, <laughs> you know, we have 200 hectares and 100 feet, fields. And you have one field with 200 hectares. So, that's, that's a little different. Yeah. But, <laughs> in Austria we say, das ist kein Wunschkonzert. What's you the other word? No, Wunsch not quite. Concert. Say it again. Wunsch concert. Wunsch. What's a wunsch? Uh, I wish. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, is the current version working? Whew. Yes. I'm uh, working on, on my bureau in my office. Hmm. Yeah, we have three feet of snow, or we have a meter of snow in the field, so I can't drive anywhere. I can't test anything. I I have it going on my, I put it on the tough book in the tractor, but um, I posted a while back, I, I'm having big issues with the tough book. Like I tried it on my laptop, it works fantastic in the tractor. No, no issues there, but I'm having issues with the freezing on my tough book. So I think it's, it's something to do with the USB cable. I can go in and uh, go around and as soon as I flip down the auto steer and it's going for a little bit, then all of a sudden that whole connection from the Arduino seems to freeze. So I got to put an extra two gigs of RAM in and I, I just got an SSD instead to see if I can make it a little faster, but it's Windows 7 ultimate 64 bit on a core duo processor so it's like a little, a little older right i don't know if it can quite handle it that's a i'm i'm 100 sure that that's a uh noise issue okay the, the grounding between the two computers is different uh, you must be double triple check that your single point grounding mm -hmm. that all your grounds come to one place yeah and even like the isolate the gps from ground and bring its power back to that single point ground as well and make sure that the antenna isn't grounded on something like the, the Arduino is sensitive to noise. And if everything doesn't come back to that single point ground, then any current you draw will generate noise and spikes 
in the other grounds of the of the other pieces and all it takes is one wrong bit especially in i2c i2c likes to really lock up with noise so i'm hundred like i say pretty much sure that it's a noise issue because as soon as you kick that motor in now you're drawing lots of current yes right and so then that'll generate a noise spike which will lock up the uh which will lock up the nano okay so, so that's a that's another direction to head now, because does it run on the simulator fine on the hook yep it runs on the sim fine um doesn't doesn't freeze as soon as i plug it in on the tractor it seems to go but that i had my lap a different laptop in and uh it seemed to work fine using that so i don't know if it's just the tough book whatever but i like the bright screen on the tough book and that's and that's a touch screen so that makes it yeah easy Ground, well, grounds are tricky grounds I'll are really try the grounds so are, are we grounding straight to everything where do you have everything grounded straight to the battery like the negative of the battery or just the shaft chassis or where is your i have uh, eight gauge wires that come from the battery to the cab and then just a piece of uh piece of plus and then i have two quarter inch bolts and then just put all the grounds on um what would they be like a three millimeter bolt and then just tie all the grounds and ground loops together on that single nut. So it's like a star configuration. Yep. It goes off to the like the 12 to 24 volt converter, and the, all the all the different power comes back to one spot. And of course, that goes to that 40 amp relay, and then to that eight gauge wire for power. So, but everything always comes back. Even the GPS, everything comes back to that one spot. Okay. I do have everything single point grounded, but it's uh, like in the box, everything grounds to one point, but then the cable that I'm, that's feeding the power. So the, the ground line is going into the tractor terminal. You know, there's a three pin crank in terminal and that's the one I'm using. So it's going to that. They're terribly no yeah, they're terribly noisy. Okay. If you can run two cables right from the positive and negative of the battery to your system, then you have nice clean power. That's the way to do it. Okay. Yeah. Because who knows where that other connector goes? Where does the ground of that cab connector, where does it eventually tie to some chassis somewhere? And then it picks up all sorts of noise. So okay. yeah, I recommend just running a good set of wires and then, well, then you always have power. And then so that's why the relays on the uh, auto steer board is so okay. that and you can always have that really good clean power. And from that, then you can switch it off and on. So give that a try. Yeah, thank you. Okay. With that, does anybody else have any other issues they need troubleshooting? Maybe throw that out. And we can send it to Guru. Nah. <laughs> it's quiet. I'm the only one with problems. <laughs> has uh, have you tried the going around obstacles with the AB line? I did. Simulator? Yeah. Very it, cool. It's not, still not 100% idiot proof. Like if it's a C shape or something, it can still get lost. Or, you know, if it's coming up to a, something like this and it has to come back around this way, it'll still, you know, it's those little edge cases that are really hard, but it gets about 99% of them, it seems to just drive around it. So. That's kind of neat. I'll be testing it for real here this spring <laughs> without anyone at the tractor, so I hope it's working. <laughs> so is it safe to say that version three is a stable version? I think it's working good. I uh, did hear from some German. Oh, we have music here. <laughs> oh, not on mine, but. Me either. Is the fat lady singing? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if we got that. If we got unlimited minutes again, so otherwise we would have been cut off. But uh, oh, sorry, it's 
it's working. I had some in my background. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, uh, I did post a, a little link. Okay. I need to post it. Uh, there was a problem um, when using the Ethernet version that uh, on the steer chart, the set point was jumping. Did you see it, Brian? Say that again, sorry. Um, I was using the Ethernet version. Okay. And on the steer chart, the set point was jumping up, down, up, down. I did post a, a YouTube video of it. Yeah, I, I couldn't see what the scale was, though. Okay. Like, if but, the, uh, like it auto it auto, auto ranges its scale, right? So okay. then if it's if it's jumping up and down at point one, then it, it looks bigger than it is. But if you um, like if it goes from zero to one hundred, then it looks like a straight line. But if it goes okay. from zero to one, then it'll jump all the way up and down. Was was the set point actually jumping around? Like was it steering okay? It was already correct that it, 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 it uh, made the output at the Arduino, at the serial board. It was okay. It, it was only in Archive GPS that the set point was jumping. Uh, I need to look in the video and uh, I try to post it here. <laughs> I need to look. Yeah. I couldn't tell what was going on. Yes. Okay. Yeah, can you share your screen? Yeah, just a moment. It, it's a YouTube video. Um, I will post it again later, okay? Okay. Because I know that there's, like, in order to save space, I removed the legend off the side that said what the scale was. But if it didn't do it in USB, then. Okay, yet yeah, now it's, I was able to post it. It's in the chat. I see it there. Okay. Um, maybe you see the, the set point is jumping 25, 27 from zero. But yeah, I don't think what, what was the problem. But at the at the at the uh, at the at the Hino, it all was okay. Um, what? Ship launch gone bad. <laughs> Sorry. It was good. Let me say, Brian, too. The other thing I noticed. Um, if you're using that ADS1115 or whatever it's called, um, all of a sudden then that screen that we have where you could do counts per degree, right. that might have to, we might have to change that slider to allow for more counts per degree on, on, the, on that scale. I don't know if that's going to work or not, or if that just totally throws everything out. But, um, it's like it needs to be a bigger number to divide. Maybe uh, it's not necessary because you're changing it in the Arduino code, but I do know like if let's say wherever you set your wheel angle sensor and if you're using that ADS1115 and you set your set point at say 13,000, uh, you don't have enough room in the set zero to, to get close, you know, if you're, if you're nowhere close. So unless you change it in the Arduino code, bit by bit that's the only way to kind of do it so but I, it works just as long as people know how to work around it you got to be yeah well the other option is to turn it into a 12-bit number okay right because at 15 bits all your you're sampling the last probably the last two bits of information are just noise anyway at 12 bits is what 4096 samples which is plenty, plenty. Mm -hmm. So maybe we're just using too big a number to start with. Just drop off the last two bits in the Arduino code. 
yeah. now your divisor can be much smaller. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like instead of taking dividing it by sixteen thousand or thousand, then you, if you're down to four thousand ninety six, like four thousand ninety six positions on your on the wheel angle sensor. That's plenty. That's, yeah. You're talking point one centimeter. <laughs> You know, oh, point, point zero 0.01 degree. Hey, Brian, if we're asking questions too, um, I may be the only person in the world using the PA OGI sentence. Um, yeah. I was playing with that one day where I was still trying to use the dog two as the angle. And when I was feeding them in, um, it appeared that it was bouncing between Peogi and dog two when I selected the dog two as the input source. Yeah. Um, when I select the AOGI as the input source, it was just picking that. It, um, I don't understand the code to, to dig into it too much, but is that something that's how you'd expect it to work or not? I don't remember the code. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to use one or the other completely. Okay. It's, because you can... Are you, are you the only one using that Peogi? Good question. I don't know of anybody else, but I, you know, I use the reach and actually it's set up yeah. where I can submit uh, the whole, all, everything I need from the GPS and roll and everything comes over that one sentence. Um, yeah. But I was trying to compare the role of the reach with the dog two is what I was playing with. Cause I know the dog two is real stable. And how does it compare? Um, in the, kitchen and the dining room table and that stuff it compares pretty well i have not had a chance to get out and actually let it bounce around in the field which is i think where we'll see the difference yeah you know on the bench it looks good but i haven't had the chance you know what's really impressive is that mma 8452 like the one that's on the pc board mm -hmm. that thing is quite a dream in terms of, a, of an angle sensor it's three bucks to four bucks I mean, that thing is incredibly good. Has anyone else used it? The 8452? I know it doesn't answer your question, John, but um, maybe the trouble with too many options, if more than one can be selected, which one should the software choose? The timing is different. Like the one is coming in by GPS and one's a USB, and if they kind of get out of sync, then one is picked first, and then the second one is picked first. and. Uh, it's like which one is the software supposed to use and I can't remember if using PAO GI the others um, but you can't use both at once that's for sure uh, yeah and that's you know I was trying to select one because everything else was coming in on, over the OGI and then I was just wanting to cherry pick the roll out of the cereal right and I know AOGI does everything, so I think it technically should shut everything else off that is contained in AOGI. Yeah. I'm going to fight. I could take a peek at it again. Yeah, I'd just be curious because the OGI alone worked. If I, even if the dog two was still feeding in over the cereal, OGI stayed right. stable, but the opposite case, it looked like it was just bouncing probably between whichever sample it picked up, you know. I'll say randomly, probably not, but how the timing was coming in. But the AOGI works if you turn off the dog, right? Or if I leave the dog on, it works. Oh, it still works. Um, it just looks like, it, well, when I say the dog on, if I deselect the dog, then AOGI works fine, even if the signal's still coming in on the serial bus. Right. So. Yeah complicated as people ask for more options and more permutations of what can be done the software involved just makes my head hurt because there's, <laughs> there's so many places stuff can hide you know and there's a lot of calculations going on in the back and you just one and it messes the whole thing up so yeah. oh, i'm not sure what to do or change or fix on that and I think forward as the you know, board comes along, that'll be my next iteration, but I still am going to play because I like the OGI that literally that's every, everything I need except for then, you know, wheel angle sensor can come in through that one. 
Right. Sentence. Definitely use that then shut everything else off. Yeah. Yeah. I did order, there's that Tindy um, HRS from like John Weiner, that Tindy. Did you see, anyone see the, I did order one of those. I'm going to give that a try for head. For me, for not the telephonist or pizza. No comprende. He was asked with how many people he was um, calling. Oh, cool. <laughs> Tell him thousands. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my kids. Oh, no, that's no, good. That's fine. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give that a whirl and see, if, see how that does for heading. I'm really, John Weiner, I think it's John Weiner or Peter Weiner. He's the guy that made that board. He's, he's, he's Tindy. And I don't think there's a guy in the world that knows more about um, magnetic sensors and the, the fusion code and that sort of thing. So I'm really looking forward to trying out that board. The, uh, the software he has is a bit of a, a bit of a schmoz, but figure it out. So hopefully, and if that little board works, I think it's, um, I think with shipping to Canada was $34 US. So, um, which is like 185 Canadian now. But, um, if that thing works, that, that'll be pretty cool. He, he claims it's within two degrees uh, absolute resolution on heading. So if it can stay within 0.1 or, or even 0.5 degree on heading, then I can throw that, pardon my French, that fucking BNO 55 in the garbage and never look at it ever again. <laughs> Oh, he's a junk. But anyway, it's the best we got for now. And which version of the Tindy did he buy? Because I know he has two or three that have a different base uh, IMU in them. Do you know which one? Um, I bought the latest one. I know there's some older ones that he made in 2015. I could look. I could post it. Can you uh, throw the link up in the chat there too? That might be helpful. I'll have to go to my other computer and get the email and get oh, the, no get the back one. But oh, there we go. Oh. Yeah, I don't know if that's the latest one, though. No, that isn't. That isn't. It's, it's the. Okay. It doesn't use the ninety two fifty. It uses some HM number. Okay. Um, I'm looking at our time here. Uh, as we got more minutes again this time around, uh, we'll make it an even hour. So is there anything else that we want to chat about or come back to that we might have missed? Crickets? What are they, what are they called? Ornithopters? Is that what they are? Yeah. <laughs> well, I would throw in a, a question. Um, I have uh, left out the B and O on the, I'm, my board because, well, it wouldn't make much sense putting the B and O on the PCB with all the currents flowing. Um, should should I put the B and O um, externally, or should I try it um, with, when I'm helping my uh, brother-in-law without a B and O, just uh, um, with GPS with RTK? Should be, it be enough? I, I would say so, yeah. Because at b &O, it's weird going around corners. It, you know, you make a 180 degree corner. If the b &O says 10 degrees going in, you make a corner. And now it says 170. Then now it has to average back to that 190. Like it... That, that's the one downfall of that BNO is it's it's okay in a straight line, you know it, it it does stabilize the heading, but if you're turning around the end of the field or doing an auto turn, it really messes it up. And then it because of that low pass high pass averaging, it takes time. So then the thing drifts off to the side and then it comes. If you have, is it a nice stable heading with the RTK? Um, well, I have tr tried it in the field yet, but. Um when I uh, made some ex um, experience with the antenna um, just outside, it looked okay, um, but... Right. Because a not, little not, bit... Not a little bit wobbly. Yet. 
sorry, a, li a little bit wobbly back and forth is better than something that's way out some of the time, but then completely out the rest of the time. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm using the Trimper system, you know, which yep. works with two antennas. And um, I hope I, I will get uh, the rest of my F9s I've ordered from Autosimber. And you know, uh, the F9 can also do a moving baseline. That uh, means if you connect two F9s, you can do the heading with two F9s on the tractor. But uh, I think I need to try it and to do it. I think uh, nobody else did done it in the past. But uh, I think it's not difficult. It's only uh, small configurations on the first F9 to send it to the second and to bring the signal back. So you can have a dual antenna system with two F9 for 600 euros. I know there's a particular little company working on that, that are putting it all in a box. They might, they might be called a hard example, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's coming. They're synchronizing the two F9s, just exactly as you say, Andreas, and then two antennas a meter and a half apart. You're looking at 0 0.1 degree heading accuracy. Yes, uh, I know it. For, from 600, for 600 bucks. <laughs> yes. I, um, I'm writing from F9, so I've ordered 20, 20 pieces. Whoa. And <laughs> <laughs> you can burn up a couple. <laughs> yes, um, at my home, at my restaurant, we have uh, a group to build, this, build systems, and we have 70 members to build a open GPS on the tractor. So uh, I have ordered all the things for 20 people. <laughs> Well, if you can figure it out, that'd be awesome. Like, that is still the best heading is to have two antennas up on top of the cab. Yes, so, and I hope in 14 days I can say you more. <laughs> I think it's not complicated. Awesome. It's, it's, I, think, I think it's very simple. I like simple. You guys know yes. that. Auto simple. I mean, <laughs> how many times have I said it's all about the heading it, with pure pursuit? I mean, you're trying to generate the correction heading based on the tractor's heading. And if the heading is going like this, then, well, your steering is going to do this. It's just math. Well, that'd be awesome. Oh, man, that'd be great. Make that simple and for anyone to do. You'd be able to do roll on that, too, would you not? Or yes. is that not? Yeah. Yes, you can do roll with, with two F9. It's no problem. So would that be going back to John's point then of putting it all in an AOGI sentence? And then, then you would have everything but your wheel angle sensor, right? Yep. Because that's what is uh, they're talking about making a special sentence for Egg Open GPS and it would contain everything. Okay. I, I hope they give you uh, a, a cut, Brian. <laughs> well, they said they might send me a couple, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. They, they just, it'd be fun to, just to play with it. I, and N-Trip? N-Trip is working? Yes, it's working very, very good. It's, I think that's, that's the best part for us European we have done. And uh, many, many people are very lucky with this. I think. Um, because with the F9, it's very hard to get the corrections in it. And so it's that too simple. <laughs> I can't believe it works. <laughs> I had no idea how N-Trip worked <laughs> two months ago. <laughs> so it's about learning, right? I've been learning so much. It, just the opportunity to learn is just, it's fascinating. Oh. Yes, uh, I've also uh, used the um, 3G modem on the XP and uh, I've written small code in micro Python and it works perfect. The only problem is uh, to get the modem online 
I think uh, the AutoSIM pro provides too many power. It's only sim somehow 750 milliampere, and that's too less for the motor. Mm. So, but they say to me in the autumn they bring a new version with more power. More power. Yeah. <laughs> ah, cool. There's one other question I was going to ask. Forget. Next time. I had a quick one there. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the averaging the high pass, low pass on heading. And let's say your GPS heading is zero degrees. And you had your brick just off by, I don't know, let's say you had it sideways. So it's, uh, it's reading 180 degrees or something like that. What, uh, is that going to be a problem or should they be aligned as close as possible? The brick is just an amazing piece of crap because what it thinks is 180 isn't 180 anyway when you turn it on sometimes. Right. Like, um, so what the software does is it doesn't matter. Once the brick determines a, a heading, it kind of pretty much stays at that heading. So even though it's pointing the wrong way, mm -hmm. Egg Open GPS takes that 180 and subtracts it from the zero and then keeps it, it determines a correction between what the BNO is saying and what the heading of the GPS is saying. So if the GPS just says it's, let's take an easier number. Say, let's say the GPS is, say you're going at 90 degrees yep. and the BNO is at, is at 40 degrees. Okay, so they're, they're kind of like this, where it thinks you're over here, but it's over here. And then what, what Ag Open GPS does is it keeps that number, that 50 degrees, and adds that 50 degrees to get to the, what the GPS is heading. Okay. So, so once you... those are the same, and now the difference between the two, it keeps averaging that to zero. Okay. So if, if you're still going 90 and the BNO drifts to 45, mm -hmm. now the difference is 45. But you can't, you can't make a change too fast. You can't make a change too slow. So it's a real balancing act between, that's why I say like the, the GPS, it generally knows where it's going. It's always right. It's always going to be around 90, whether it's 88, 92, 88, 92. But the BNO is fairly stable if you're going in a straight line. So if it's saying 45, or sorry, that original 50, then, um, that error of 40 doesn't change much. But over time, it okay. just yeah. it's really hard to explain. You have to look at the code, but and that probably doesn't help either. Because I, I almost don't understand the code. But basically, all you're doing is you're taking chunks of those errors and slowly merging the two together so that the reading of the BNO plus that error, they, they really point the same direction. Uh, if it's I understand correct, the BNO error on the long term is fairly high, but on the short term, it's really low. And in GPS, it's the other way around. Exactly. That's why I say high pass and low pass. Okay. So, so I guess that, that answers my question. And if the brick was saying it was, you know, if it's off by to totally the other direction, it's just right. really taking the delta in the, in the heading of the brick. And then... Right and using that as, as into the filter. So you, I mean, the first time it's 180 degrees. Yeah. Right. And then you take half of that error and add, and it'd be 90 yeah. degrees, yeah. 45 degrees, and then 22. And then, yeah. you know, and as it gets closer, it, it starts to move slower. You know, every time you take, um, every time you take half, right. It, yeah. Yeah. it becomes slower and slower and slower. Yes. And over time, your GPS over time is more accurate, but the BNO, Exactly as Doppelgrau says, the uh, the BNO is very good on a short time. The the GPS is very good over a long period of time. And you, you know, you just try to fuse those together so that it generally takes the advantages of both and makes a single heading. Yeah. It works too bad, I have to admit. Like it, you turn the BNO off, and then the thing is, it doesn't steer as good as with the BNO on. That's for sure. Like say, just going around the corner, that's when you kind of run into trouble. Right. 
but the brick is better at that. Is that right? Or is, yeah. No. Yeah. Well, no, the, like going around a corner, then the brick is terrible. It's still terrible. Yeah. Because now you have like a 10 degree error to fix. Sure. And then, so then it thinks now it takes that long GPS time to take that 10 degrees out. So now your, your wheel angle sensor and the pure pursuit have that error. Yes. And start heading off the line and then you come back on the line. Yeah. yeah. And that's all because, because of the BNO has that drift. Right. And if you could eliminate that drift, hopefully this Kindy product you know, is better at making the 180 degrees. Cool. At least that's how I think it works. <laughs> for, the, for the math guys, you can well imagine that is when you're at zero and you're trying to average 359 and one. That is where 90% of the code solves that circular, it's called what, circular error, going from averaging one and 359 and ending up with zero. Mm -hmm. that, that is tricky math. Mm -hmm. that, that is the hardest part of the math. Uh, just a, a um, question, um, is a prop uh, probably a, some part of the heading error of the GPS coming from the fact that it's um, bouncing on the roof to the left and the right. So yep. from the point of view of the GPS, it's driving to, a bit to the left or to the right. So if someone is more than crazy enough to um, get the somehow this, this error out, that might get um, GPS setting a bit better, but I think it's, well, that looks should be really ugly. Yeah, well, that's where your, yeah, that's where your roll sensor now, mm -hmm. you know, if your roll sensor could read at 10 Hertz, just like your GPS, because your roll will determine yep. and then correct the antenna. But the problem is we have the roll in with the Arduino. So the GPS comes in and then 10 milliseconds later, the, uh, the roll comes in or like 100 milliseconds later, the, the roll comes in. But meanwhile, the antenna's moved. So mm -hmm. we're constantly trying to correct the wrong position. If the antenna's going like this, but you're correcting over here, <laughs> well then how that? Okay, um, when I'm using the um, ESP, I could send both at the same time, or more or less the same time. Is the... Um, Corrected in the ESP. Hmm? Corrected yeah, all in the ESP. That might be one option, or the other was for me is, is the um, order of the messages important? So if I send first um, the roll angel and then the GPS or better the other way around? Or it doesn't matter because it's checked periodically and if both messages are sent more or less at the same time. Well, remember that GPS is delayed 50 to 70 milliseconds already. So it, even the message coming from the GPS is, is not where the actual antenna is. Mm -hmm. it's, and that's why every engineer just starts, runs and screams the other way when you talk about slow moving heading. Because it's really, really, really hard to get a good accurate heading when you're going slow. But if you have the two antennas, right, then they both move. And then you're able to, to calculate it all at once in the GPS. And that's where like Andreas's system, work so well with, with the Trimble because they do all the calculations on board. And I'll say with the PIV um, sentence, what I'm doing on the reach is I'm constantly reading the roll from the IMU at like 100 hertz. And then as soon as a new GPS message comes in, it just grabs that, fuses a sentence together and sends it out um, to try to sync those up. So then I think once in your code, if you get it as one message, Brian, I'd assume that takes it then as one instantaneous point. We'll use those for the solution. Is that yeah. Correct? Yeah. It just, whatever's there it uses. I mean, it could up the rate that the Arduino sends it at. Like the Arduino sends it at 10 Hertz. If you're using a five Hertz GPS signal, but then how do you account for all the delays? Right. And as much as a tractor bounces around, honestly, the steering can't keep up with that anyway. So you still have to yeah. filter. You know, so in some ways having that bounce back and forth, 
actually works better than being straight because it kind of keeps correcting, you know, on a meaning, 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 yeah. you know, because if it's, if everything's perfect, it probably drift more than it bouncing back and forth. I mean, that's why we gave up on the PID, right? Because the differential term was causing more noise and more shaking than, you know, the, the textbook PID doesn't work worth the hoot, but just straight proportional does because it just keeps kind of seeking back and forth. Um, the John Deere ATUs, ATU, the John Deere steering, the ones in the wheel, it uses a stepper motor, by the way. It doesn't use a DC motor. I learned that. Yes, uh, I was at the school and they did put it or out of it and there is nothing interesting in it. It's a, <laughs> chain, a chain of made of plastic and that motor, that's all. Um, another thing to the, the moving um, heading, um, I've tried uh, summing out, uh, I did call it XDA filter. Um, I did uh, run the distance from the current line through to a filter to smooth it a bit. So if the, if the, the field is going so, the steering was, was reacting very fast. And with that filter, it worked very good. So I, I did um, put it in my version and maybe I will try it out. It can, I can turn it on and off. And um, months ago, it, it worked very well for me. So if I turn it on, the steering goes very smooth. And uh, I know it, go, I think it is also in Serea, they have a, a small filter for it. So the distance from the line is also filtered a little bit. I, I tried that too using the, um, shoot, what's the name of the filter? X to F filter. The Kalman, <laughs> yeah, the Kalman filter. And what I found was that it steered it didn't steer fast enough because it filtered out those small changes and then it didn't steer as tightly on the line because now the, the filter caused a delay. Because it, it changed too slowly and it, it just, it drifted more with the filter. It steered, okay. it steered better. Like it didn't steer as much back and forth, but it didn't stay on the line as well either. It's you okay. don't for nothing. Uh, I did not use a caramel filter. I did use a, I think a low pass filter. Yeah. I did add 10 pieces of the old and one of the A and did uh, divide it through it. So cool. it reacts more fast. Right. Kind of like the high pass, low pass again. Mm -hmm. Okay. I did not <laughs> yeah. know what they done, but it, it did work very well. Cool. Because yeah, um, I thought about that too, is if you could filter out some of that noise, that'd be good. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, a comment on the stepper motor. I think one reason why they might use a stepper mo motor is because it's then easier to define how many degrees you want to turn the reel. Um, we have yeah. to, to find out how many PVM <laughs> equals turning the reel 1.3 degrees. And if you have the stepper motor, you can say, well, this means 4,000 steps and you run it 4,000 steps and then you have turns your wheel at 1.3 degrees and you don't, it, it makes the math a bit easier and the, the loop of the, um, for the PI, you don't need a separate PID loop so far. If you want to turn 1.3 degrees in one direction, you can simply tell the motor turn so many steps and then you're finished. Yes, uh, the school told me the thing is working so they didn't use a wheel and to sign with the RTO. But uh, if the John Deere was driving into the, the field is also working at the, at the beginning and if aura is calibrated, it runs smooth. But it's like it's like uh, like Serea. It's without the wheel and the center, it can drive very good. If you could get a nice steady heading like from dual antennas, then you 
doesn't need the wheel angle sensor either. It's all about that steady heading and knowing what direction the tractor is going because steering angle is just a change in heading. And if you can calculate that directly from the GPS antenna, then you wouldn't need the, uh, you wouldn't need the wheel angle sensor. So hopefully these, the dual antenna with the P, that is gonna open up a whole lot of possibilities and make things a lot simpler. I don't know, can you go call him? Hi, John. <laughs> um, you say uh, when you use a dual system, you don't need the wheel angle sensor? Well, the only reason you have the wheel angle sensor is so that you know where the tractor is going, which direction it's heading. But if the GPS antenna tells you what direction the thing is heading, then why do you need the wheel angle sensor? Like if the heading isn't changing, you know that the wheels are pointing straight out. If the thing is turning at, at 0 0.01 rads per second, you know that your steering wheels are turned. Okay. And the faster it turns, the more your, your wheel angles turned. Okay. You can, write, you can write the code and they can test it tomorrow. It's easy to write the code because now all you're doing is you're comparing your heading with the desired pure pursuit angle. It's, it's, it's 10 times simpler code. Okay, maybe you can put it in. <laughs> but if you, if, you, um, if you try to use a wiggly heading, then it just goes all over the place. Yes. It's stable heading, and then it works. That's what Outback does with like swathers. Swathers don't have steering wheel angles. They just have, they're like a cat or a, like a track, a double track vehicle. They don't have a steering wheel angle sensor but those swathers track perfectly straight. So they have a, a really good heading system in their antenna. I noticed that in the Trimble in the, the J530 we had. Um, it was just a miraculously steady heading. And I tried, I, we didn't have an auto steer in that tractor at that time, but did the math in Agile and GPS, and yeah, it works perfectly. So then you wouldn't need any wheel angle sensor or anything. You just use the, and then you can get into things like acceleration. Like how quickly do you want to accelerate that tractor? Like what is the rate of change? Like what is your differential in the rate of change of the, the head? Cool. So then like, um, like in CNC where you can accelerate a, accelerate a motor, run at a constant speed and then decelerate the motor, you can accelerate and decelerate steering of the tractor. Ideal for autonomous. It comes down to a nice steady head. Lots more to learn yet. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't have a heading or a wheel angle sensor today, does the code work at all or does it crash? Or does it, it crashes? Steer well, well, it doesn't crash. It just doesn't work. It doesn't steer. Okay. Yeah. Because what the Arduino does is it tries to match the, uh, the I go up and GPS calculates a wheel angle heading. And then, you know, if it, if it wants one degree, then that's just what it puts the wheels at. But there's no way to know okay, what so the steering Arduino wheel closes is. the loop. Yeah, that's your feedback mechanism. Yeah. Just a quick question on PID. Did anyone try the differential term, calculating the differential term on the set point and not the actual reading of the wheel angle sensor? Say that again. <laughs> like, like normally your PID, like the differential term is about is, is history, right? Like how fast is the thing moving? Like if, if your points in between are really large, then you know that the thing is moving very quickly. And what the differential term does is when it gets towards the set point, you want to slow that down. That's what the differential term does. So you're starting here, you go very quickly, and then they differential term needs to slow down more and more. So what we, the wheel angle sensor is the, the, the reading coming back from it and like the proportional and the integral and the derivative are normally used on the air 
And if the air is bouncing all over the place, then that differential term is bouncing around a lot. And I was reading up on, on, P, on some more advanced PID stuff. And what they use is, instead of using what the, the difference is or that error is, you just take the, the, the set point readings and those are, those are calculated and actually quite stable. So you use the differential term difference from those set points as opposed to the error signal. So then you don't get those, those large shifts between the heading and the, the wheel angle sensor difference and all that other stuff. It just gives you a stable differential term instead of using what the actual and the error is. Lost everyone. I, I have not tried that. <laughs> Either have I. I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting concept because all you want is that how close am I and how fast am I moving? And you should be able to get that from your set point, which again, should be fairly stable. So it's using all that other noise into it and then trying to do calculations on that difference. Because even if, if you have a bunch of error on the signal and the, the signal is going plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus minus one, then the differential term, even though you want to go straight out, the differential term is kicking that motor back and forth. Mm -hmm. right? So you're really close to where you should be. The noise makes that term the opposite direction because remember differential wants you want you to slow the motor down. That's your, that's your brakes on the system. Now it's causing error. But if your set point says zero, now your differential term is nice and steady. So yeah, I'm gonna give that a try here this spring. That's, a that's cool something concept. you you cannot do on the bench again. <laughs> you have to be in a tractor to try that out. Or you need a nice large shaking bench. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there's some other ideas to try. We don't have a room of engineers to figure this stuff out, so. Um, what, one uh, question again to the real en en um, sensor. So, in theory, um, you could emulate a, a real angel sensor if you have. Um, for example, a stepper motor or um, something that count, counts the um, RPMs and calibrate by turning the wheels to the left and to the right each time with the motor and then, but yeah, to the mass internally where your wheels should be at the moment. Um, of, of course, it would be very inconvenient each time having to turn the wheels to both the directions to find um, out, but in theory, it should work. You would still have to calculate what your, um, the diameter yeah. of the turn circle is in the end. And that's another, yeah. that's another thing you can play around with to adjust your steering and how quickly is your wheelbase. Remember your wheelbase is used to determine what the radius of the turn circle is. So that you can increase it. If you increase your wheelbase, you turn sharper. If you decrease your wheelbase, then it doesn't turn as sharp. Other setting that you can use to kind of fine tune and play with. Yeah. You know, so many ideas. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going on about an hour and a half here, and I think in in interest of people's evenings or mornings or whatever time it is by you, maybe we should uh, try and wrap it up here. I think we kind of all know where everybody's from. I said we we're going to do the intros at the end, which makes no sense, but. Um, I think we'll we'll try and wrap it up, and then I'll post it up on on the combine form. Um, unless there's anything else, I think we'll we'll try and sign off here. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Have a nice evening. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Wilbert. No problem.